alert issue with creatives is getting uh, past blocks, whether it's personal or professional blocks. Uh, you have multiple projects on the go. Uh, so what, can you give me an example of a block that you have run into and overcome? Mm -hmm. Actually, having multiple projects on the go is how I overcome blocks, in that when I'm blocked on something, I'll work on another project that's radically different, and that'll free up your brain space uh, to, to do the other thing. It's like I never do more cleaning than when I'm on a deadline. Yeah. And then it's like, yeah, I could clean the house. <laughs> or uh, when there's something that I have to do around the house, yeah, now I'll work on the, the work. Your brain never wants to do what it's supposed to, so it's just a, a matter of constantly tricking it. Right on. Like, almost like giving it a little break yeah. in between. That's funny because uh, uh, I had just interviewed uh, Hal Hilden, and uh, he had a, a similar type of... Uh, type of answer of, of uh, like, you know, never stop working on projects if you hit a block, yeah. work on another project. That's right. Yeah. Just kinda, shift it over. Keep, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I also, I've got a background in improv, and mm -hmm. in improv, you've got no choice but to just keep going. Like, you yeah. run out of ideas, tough luck. Yeah. Just come up with something stupid and then correct the stupid element later on. Yeah. Like, you never say no, you just say yes to the next thing. That's right, yeah. And you got to turn off your judgment. That's that's what's stopping you, is, is the little judge in your head going, not good enough. And it's like, good enough for now. Move on, then come back, fix it later. Right on. That's cool. Good answer. <laughs> So what does, uh, what you do for a living, what does that mean to you? Like ha how, I guess how, what kind of meaning does it have for you? Well, uh, it's uh, an outlet for ideas that I have, so that feels healthy. Uh, and the other thing is when I get to meet the people who read the book, uh, the impact it has on them, that means a lot. There's a, I, I know a couple of kids who learned how to read, reading the stuff that I've written. Nice. You know, the overcoming uh, dyslexia, uh, and that's a big deal to me. Or some people who, you know, it's it's a silly book, but silly books get people through tough times sometimes. Yep. And so I've heard a lot of that, and and that's that's pretty fantastic. Yeah. 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 But for for me, for the most part, it's uh, you know, you've got some creative ideas, and it's nice having a place to put them. And with the amount of things that I do, there's always a home for the ideas that I have. So yeah, I, I love that. Nice. Yeah, I imagine, like especially stories like, like you said, like uh, people being able to read or overcome uh, reading obstacles. I imagine that's incredibly satisfying. You know, like something you probably wouldn't expect nope. going into it, but just uh, an incredible side effect. To, well, that's uh, also that's also kind of how I learned to I, I I learned to kind of fall in love with Shakespeare was reading Thor comics. Yep. You know, and that was that was my gateway into that. So That's it's cool. it's cool hearing that that continues. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, what human obstacles have you run into that have dampened your creative juices? Uh, just uh, that I have to sit for so long when when you're writing, uh, that can get to you. Yeah. And uh, there's a loneliness to working, uh, you know, where you're spending eight to ten hours a day in your own head, kind of at a desk, uh, coming up with this stuff. Uh, that you really have to break it up with some exercise or doing something. And it, but it's hard because you're so obsessed with this world that you're creating that you don't want to stop. Yeah. But it's a big mistake to not. Yeah. So yeah, it's just it's a, a strain. Th yeah, the physical uh, obstacles are your basics, your carpal s tunnel syndrome, sitting with in a, in a desk with your uh, back hunched over, and yeah. I hear you. That's I mean, just a common thing for the world right now, right? Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm usually like that with my photography. I, I love the shooting, and I love doing the post afterwards, but it takes a toll. Yeah. Takes a big toll, and and like you said, you don't want to stop, but. There's always that something. little bit done. Yeah, I'm doing a lot of uh, sketch comedy stuff now that we're editing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you never want to step away from the because it can always be a little better. Always yeah. be a little better. So it's nice to have the deadlines that force you to stop. Yeah. And then you also you've got to take some breaks and yeah. get outside. Yeah. yeah or, exactly. Uh, that way lies madness. <laughs> kind of the whole purpose of doing it is to be able to have that. You can live your life a certain way. Have that freedom. To, to go outside. Yeah. So when you don't do it, it kind of defeats the point almost. Yeah, I'm my own boss, but the drag is that I can never get away from my boss. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. Uh, any hints on what 2014 is going to bring with your work? Any new projects? 
Uh, geez, that is a good question. Yes, uh, in um, in the Simpsons comics, we have a Bartman story where uh, his identity is revealed to the world, and we see the consequences of that. A similar thing happened in Spider-Man comics a couple of years ago, and mm -hmm. this is our kind of play on what would happen, you know, in, in the, the Simpsons the world. world. Yeah. yeah. And I've got a whole bunch more uh, superhero sketches coming up for the Irrelevant Show on CBC Radio, which is something else that I do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Mark Meir, uh, is, who's the voice of Commander Shepard in the Mass Effect games, plays Superman in all the sketches that I write for the Irrelevant Show. And he's fantastic, so it's always a treat yeah. to, uh, to get him you know, to, uh, yeah. to do that. Yeah. Any, uh, anything with your improv? With improv? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a, a live D&D show called the Critical Hit Show we do once a month in Vancouver that's uh, become pretty popular and uh, yeah, we've been having a lot of fun doing that. Cool. Last question. Uh, what single piece of advice could you give our readers about making a living as a creative artist? Any, uh, any type of genre, really. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, first, uh, the first thing I'd say is whatever you're doing, give a damn about it. Don't do something just because you think it'll be popular because uh, that popular idea that you've got, the idea, someone else is going to do that. All you've really got to sell is yourself, and if uh, the only way to do something that other people care about deeply is for you to care about it deeply and have that translate. So uh, tr when you're starting off, at the very least, try to only do stuff that you that you care about, and then make sure you finish it. Yeah, that's the real trick too. You're always going to have like uh, the motivation to get started, but then you're going to get tired of it. Uh, but you got to work past the getting tired of it, and that's yeah. the real trick. That's the difference between amateur and professional is you finish the thing that you're tired of doing. <laughs> right. So basically, uh, do your passion and make sure to ship it in the end. <laughs> yeah. Make sure it gets out there and gets yeah. finished and gets and gets up where people can see it. A lot of people, you know, have this, this sketchbook full of ideas, and that's fantastic. But yeah. you got to finish them. You got to get them out there. That's the only way to get it done. Yeah. Any last words? Uh, and look, uh, do the things that you love. That's that's the only way to live. Cool. That's great.